Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of 30 Minutes Robotic Milking Edition. I'm your host, Marcia Andres, dairy science professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota in the St. Paul campus. I'm pleased to have with us today our co-host, Jim Sulfur, dairy extension educator at the St. Cloud Regional Office. Hi, Jim. How are you today? Hi. Hi, thanks for inviting me and welcome everyone. Yeah, thank you for your help too. Much appreciated. So as a reminder, if some of you are watching, this is a recorded event. Um, in order to join the live discussion uh, on the third Thursday of every month at 11.30 a.m. Central U.S. time, you needed to register. For that, please go to z.umn.edu slash 30 M I N R M. Oops, excuse me. We are using a Zoom platform for this discussion today. So, in order to ask your question or make a comment after the producer's overview of their dairy operation, please use the QA box, the QA, not the chat box, please. It, you can find that on the bottom of your screen. And you can type your question or comment, and then either Jim or I will read the question or comment on your behalf. I want to use this opportunity to also invite you to attend an event that we're organizing for this summer, the Precision Dairy Conference, June 22nd and 23rd at the Hyatt Regency in Bloomington, which is about a five minute drive from the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. We're going to have a limited capacity for an in-person attendance, along with the virtual option. For details, please go to precisiondairy at umn.edu. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite our guest to join us. And our guest today is dairy producer, David from central Minnesota. Hi, David, how is, how's it going today? Oh, not too bad, enjoying a mild winter. That's good, that's good. So I do appreciate, we're very pleased to have you here to join us and uh, to give us an overview of your operation first before we can uh, move on to some questions and discussion. Uh, I'll be turning on live caption as since we all what we have now will be pictures of your farm. And then if anybody wants to turn them off, they can uh, go ahead and find that on the bottom of their screen and turn it off. So I'll mute myself. You can take about 10 minutes or so, David. And when you need to go to a different picture, just please let me know. Okay. All right. Well, that's a picture of our farm. We started robots in 2014, and that's the same year that I came back to the farm. Um, a lot has changed from now till then. Uh, initially, we built a cross ventilated barn with four robots and we continued to milk in our parlor. And the initial plan was to eventually stop in the parlor and uh, just see how the robots were going to work. And um, we did that for about two years, and then we decided actually to flip our barn and add four more robots. Um, the main deciding factor be for that was the parlor was becoming a lot of work handling both barns. Um, we, we didn't really have the labor needed to go to both places too, because we didn't have enough work in the one barn. And so we were having to shuffle back and forth. Um, the one benefit of having the parlor going at the time was we were able to maximize our robots move cows that didn't work real well um, or the ones that were going dry in the parlor. So it really made that those four robots work pretty hard. Um, but and then in 2017, we decided we started up the other half of the barn and then we shut the parlor down. And uh, I think initially we started about 360 cows and we just uh, we expanded from within um, because we started a little early with the expansion. We weren't quite prepared for um, the numbers quite yet, but we, we knew we had them coming. So rather than buy replacements, we just expanded from within for the most part. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is uh, the picture you can see both halves of the barn. Actually, there's a garage door in the middle there. Um, 
So the first part of the barn was where the robots are, where you can see now. And then we, we basically just flipped the barn and added the other half to it. Um, we have eight robots. They're in a toll booth style setup. And then we have hospital pens um, beyond each robot so we can route cows. We have a Juno that pushes up feed. And uh, like I said, a cross ventilated barn, you can hop to the next slide already. So we have a six row barn with water beds, and then we have a, a inlaid mat, a rubber mat where they eat. So when they're eating, they're not on concrete. And uh, we, we bed twice a week with sawdust over top of the water beds. Um, consistently, we, we average about 130 smack cell. We were a little better when we had the parlor, but if you combine the two barns, we're probably still at the 130. Um, but the cows really, really like the barn. We built it for comfort and that definitely, definitely makes a difference when you're going from about 220 cows in a, um, just an old freestyle barn from the 90s to a, a more state-of-the-art, well-ventilated barn. Um, you know, when you focus your eyes on cow comfort, you're gonna see a definite return if you have plans to build a new facility. So you can have one more pen or one more picture. So these are the hospital pens that are just beyond the robots. Um, the one thing to note about our, our setup, these pens don't have access to the robots. And you know some people like to make sure they position the robots so that the cows can still visit if they're in the hospital pen. Um, the question I always propose to them is, well, are these the cows that you want visiting um, on their own? You know, there's a reason she's in a hospital pen. It might be because she's lame or she has mastitis and you want to make sure you strip out her before she gets milked or something along those lines. Um, you know, we don't try to collect cows and keep them in the hospital pens. The goal is to get them out to the herd. And so we have four pens just like this. We utilize two for maternity pens and then one for kind of a a fresh cow treated pen, and then one for um, non-treated cows. So cows that are gonna have sellable milk, um, but maybe they're lame or they're just off feed, but they have no drug withdrawal in them. Kind of makes things a little easier. Um, we can run all the treated cows together and do one wash versus a, a wash after each treated cow. And then our maternity pens, we split mature cows and heifers up, and then we pre-train our heifers. So we'll run them in twice a day they get a little feed, get familiar with the robot, and then that makes the transition for when they calve um, a lot easier on the people and on the cow itself because she knows what's going on to an extent. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect, but it definitely saves time and energy. Um, initially, we had intention of just training heifers when we had free time in the barn, so when we started and the barn wasn't full, but we realized it saved us a lot of time um, by, by running them in, we're, we're basically spending about a half an hour a day. If you look at robot time for about 10 heifers and uh, it wouldn't be uncommon if you get a fresh heifer that calved that didn't have any training to spend 20 minutes on her, just try to get her hooked up. And so just uh, that really tests your patience. It really tests the robot itself because it gets a beating sometimes. Um, but it makes things a lot easier. And right now it's not uncommon for us to have a heifer calf. And when she's ready to go out in the main herd, we may not see her again until it's time to breed her. And so for us, that makes a huge difference if she can hit the ground running, start visiting and uh, making a return on that investment right away versus you know that the animal that takes forever to get hooked up, it's gonna take her at least a week, if not more than you know a few weeks to get familiar with the robot and want to visit. I always said they have to, you know, they have to walk in the robot after being collected on their own. And then the goal is to get them to walk in when they're not being collected. And if we can at least get them familiar with the machine and walk in prior to being, prior to calving, um, that, that just eliminates a lot of stress on that animal. Um, the other thing that, you know, we kind of do a little different. So we have eight robots and uh, we really only have three full-time employees right now. And we have some part-time help. And so the advisors that we work with, they, they, they believe we're one of the most efficient from a labor perspective um, for a farm. I've been to talks before and they may say, you know, they have eight robots or 12 robots. 
and only have one or two people in the barn. But what they're not usually telling you is they have a parlor and uh, another barn elsewhere where all the, the trouble cows are and the maternity cows are. And so we do everything from, the only thing we don't do is raise our heifers from three months until when they're pregnant. So we, we deal with all the calves, all the maternity cows, we deal with all the hospital cows, all the sick cows, um, and we run them all through the robots. We don't have a, a second source to milk our cows. And uh, so when you're looking at, potentially we can run the farm on two people if we had to at about 500 cows. Um, you know, it, it's either a compliment or, or it's somebody saying that you do a lot of work. And so some days can definitely get long, but uh, you know, we try to focus on being efficient and trying to make sure that um, we're saving time in areas that we can so we can get to other things. And that kind of goes off our breeding strategy too, is we're not necessarily shooting for production, we're shooting for um, efficiencies, cows that are gonna have minimal problems with attachments. And so when you're looking at a linear, um, the big things are udder clef, root teat placement and teat length that you need to make sure you got a nice sound square udder. Otherwise we have cows that definitely need some help. And uh, because we've essentially went from 220 cows to 480, 490 in a, you know, in a relatively short time period, um, we still have problem cows that we're dealing with, which if we were uh, an established herd that essentially added robots and didn't grow, or didn't add any cows, we'd be in a little bit different situation than we are now. Um, but it, it took us a while to, to get to where we're at now. And uh, we've kind of focused our, our mindset from growth to more, um, you know, cleaning up the herd. And uh, like I said, being more efficient. Um, anyone that's added cows to the herd knows what growing pains are. And, uh, you know, we finally, once we finally filled up the barn, it took a little while just to clean up some of the cows that probably didn't belong. And now we're at the point where things are really starting to click and they're starting to take off. And in another year or so, we should be at a, a even bigger diff, bigger point than we are now. Um, looking back just at 2020, we've gained about 4,000 pounds and uh, some Excel hasn't changed, Repro hasn't changed. Those were already pretty good. And so just from a, a pure volume standpoint, um, with the same number of cows, we're uh, starting to really take off. And part of that, like I said, is because we've, we've shifted our mindset from growth to improvements. And uh, so, yeah, that's all of my pictures I have. I guess I'll transition to questions that you may have. Um, the one thing that you need to consider, I guess that I was gonna talk about is, you know, things that we really like, Obviously, we can't milk this many cows with this few of people, but understand that you're trading labor for parts and for service and for maintenance. Um, the machine is there every day, but you still have to take care of it. And uh, so when you say, well, we're going to save on labor, it's not necessarily a, a, a labor saving deal. It's the fact that you're not having to deal with um, as many people. And everyone knows the hardships when an employee quits short notice or doesn't show up. The robot's always gonna be there. And so that's one less thing that you have to worry about, but also consider that you're on call 24 seven. And so as a family farm, you know, when you get a family event that's far away, somebody still has to be within driving and distance to come back. Excellent. Thank you for, you know, super efficiency that you have. Excellent, congratulations. But you work super hard too, like you said. Uh, we appreciate the overview. I think we stimulated some questions. Jim, uh, do you wanna go and maybe ask the first question? How do you wanna proceed? Sure, there's a question here, David. Do you just wanna talk a little bit about your transition to robots? Uh, why, why you transitioned, why you chose the brand of robots that you did? Was that a hard decision? So just kind of about your, your whole transition when you went from your parlor to your robots. So I, uh, I graduated college in May and the plans were already in place, unbeknowing to me. So when I committed to come back home, then I was included on the fact that this was going to happen. And it also sounded like this was going to be my job. So as far as the initial, you know, why Laylee, um, you know, 
why it went the way it did. The biggest thing for my dad and my uncle at the time were the the fact that uh, they're dealing with a lot of high school kids, milk and cows, and the barn was about time for an upgrade. So they decided to go build a new barn, add robots to eliminate kind of the stress of having to deal with a lot of employees. I think at the time they had 15 high school kids. And uh, so that's kind of why they transitioned to robots. I can't really say, you know, I wasn't included on the initial, you know, is why we uh, added the, the second half to the barn though. It was again, labor shortage. Um, we didn't have enough work for all the, for, for that many employees, obviously. And uh, it was becoming a lot of work just for the, the owners themselves having to run back and forth. So like we added robots, but we also doubled our cows. So we didn't add robots to save labor. We added robots to basically milk more cows with the same amount of later labor. And actually now we've, we've hired a full-time guy and we have another one hired in May because we actually went through a farm transition on top of all that too. So we've had a lot of changes on all for that seven years. Um, the biggest thing you need to consider for a brand is your service. You know, where is it? How far is it? And uh, is that somebody you want to deal with? Because you're not just buying a robot, you're, you're basically buying the service for it too. And so that's a decision you have to make with anything, whether it's a piece of equipment or, you know, something along those lines. If you have something that's going to break, you need somebody that can fix it. That's a very good point. So I'll go to the next one. Um, can you please describe the setting of the AMS for not milking the heifers when you train them? It was not very clear how we actually, what you actually do sure. as the heifers get into that box. So they're, they're in a different a group. You can group all your animals however you want. Um, and they're in a group where it, it's going to simulate as if they're going to be milked, but the arm doesn't go underneath them. So the arm moves, the brushes spins, it makes some noises, it starts the vacuum pump all familiar sounds, familiar movements, but it's not gonna to physically touch them. It's not gonna to try to milk them. And it be, it's because they're in this group, it's like a training group. Um, and they're, like I said, they're in there for three minutes and they get like two pounds of feed. So basically just enough to get their appetite going and uh, just enough time to at least get familiar with being closed. Cause they're essentially in a, you know, in a little cage if you wanna look at it. And, uh, you know, to an animal that can be daunting to go in a small area. And so if they can overcome the fact that this is a safe place, I get fed in here. And like I said, when they transition and have a calf, that's, that's one less step that we have to worry about. Yes, has sure. worked really well for you guys. <laughs> that's great. Jim, hey, David, next. Yeah, I'll combine a couple of them here. There's a couple related to metrics. So what are the things you look on for T4C? There's a question on what's the number one metric you look at. So do you want to comment a little bit about your metrics that you look on in your screen and maybe even how you use those metrics? Sure. So everyone's going to have different goals, obviously. The first thing that I do in the morning um, is just look at health issues. Okay, who's popping up and why? And, uh, you know, I know every cow in the barn. And so I kind of know what's considered normal and what's not normal. So if I have a cow that's out 12 hours and she normally gets milk four times a day, that's a problem. And so what we do is if we identify these problem cows, whether it's a high conductivity, um, they're down in rumination, so they're off feed, or maybe you know something hasn't been picked up yet, but they haven't been milked and that could be an issue as well. These cows are routed and then they go into those hospital pens and uh, you know, sometimes we route a healthy cow and she's perfectly fine. And, you know, why didn't she go in and get visit and get milked? You know, I don't know. I like to say maybe sometimes they oversleep. But, uh, you know, as far as metrics go, it's just what's off. Is it a high conductivity? Are they down in milk? Are they down in rumination? Or are they in heat? So they're in, they're in a high activity time period. Um, but, for me, it, it's more of, I know my cows, I know what's normal with every cow. And if you see certain indicators pop up, that might be alarming. We route those cows, we check them out and we deal with whatever we have to deal with. David, can I ask kind of a follow-up that's related to that is, are there any targets you have for like free time, milk per robot? Are there any kind of goals that you get a little concerned about that if you don't see, you wanna comment a little bit on maybe your targets yeah. on some of those numbers? So I don't have like a rough 
you know, this is what I need to hit. Um, rumination is going to be different if you get a ration change, if you go to different farms. I see farms over 500 minutes for rumination. I sit at about 4.30. Um, free time, that, that really has to deal with how many cows are in the barn. Um, for us, we built the barn for 60 cows a robot. That's where we like to sit at. If we push more cows into the barn, um, we end up just creating more work. We have more fetch cows. We have more more problems because certain cows can't get access to that robot. Um, when the barn's full for us, you know, we, we average about a 6.45, six minute, 45 second box time. That includes the prep and uh, free time. Right now we got 486 cows in the barn. Our free time's at about 10%. So that's pretty normal for us. Um, but, you know, as we go through calving slugs and things like that, We'll end up with 490, 495 cow, cows in the barn. And for us, that becomes too much. We need to either cull some or dry some off early or something to alleviate some of that stress. Because with robots, you can't just add 20 cows. You only have 24 hours a day to milk cows, actually 20, 23 when you include wash times, but you can't add time to the day. And so when you add more cows, that just means fewer cows are getting milked as often as maybe you would like to. And so as far as targets go, you know, we're growing our production. Um, I, I imagine in another year we'll have grown it even more. Um, you know, I try to keep failures as low as possible. That's probably the, if I had a goal for failures, you know, that's the one thing that I really want to hit hard is, you know, if you're thinking about robots or you're, you're having serious discussions, you can start your breeding program for robots right now. That's the one thing you can do. And, uh, you know, it shows decisions that were made three years ago or, you know, they show now. And, uh, you know, if you use a bull that you're not overly thrilled about from a robot perspective, it's going to show. And so we use genomics as well to try to limit animals that might have an unideal udder conformation. Um, we also use it for breeding strategy as well. But, uh, you know, for me, I guess my only real goal is try to minimize that failure because I never like a cow coming into the box, getting stimulated and not being completely milked because then she goes out and she might go lay down and she's leaking milk. And so then she just kind of creates a problem. So we have only seven and a half minutes left, just uh, for a warning here. Uh, we have tons of questions, uh, it's, which is great. So hopefully uh, you and I can get together later, David, and try to answer some of the questions that we couldn't get to. Unfortunately, some of, some of people are seeing anonymous, so I cannot get back to them, but I'll try to somehow get back in some way, shape or form. One question is a big question, but what would you do differently if you were to build again, like anything different in the barn. And, and also a clarification question from the same attendee, which, what's uh, the sheen on the wall where the robot is installed? Is that a tile or what, what is it? That, does it make it easier to clean? Uh -oh. So some barn. So really. the, the sheen is just, uh, I don't know, just a metal. It's so the cows okay. don't okay. beat up the wall. I mean, okay. if you had your typical tin, they'd beat it up. Sounds um, good. As, as far as what we do different, mm -hmm. not a whole lot. Um, the only thing that I guess we'd do different if we knew we were going to flip the barn as quick as we did, we would have expanded our heifer inventory so we were prepared for it from essentially day one. Um, when we flipped the barn, we made essentially no changes to the barn. So we were happy with our initial decisions and we stuck with that. Sounds good. Uh, there's some questions. Just what do you know what your return on investment is? Or are you happy? Maybe a better way to say that you could answer is, is it financially what you kind of had expected and anticipated when you first built it? So I, I'm kind of the barn manager. I kind of have been. Um, I'm not the big financial guy, but uh, because of our farm, farm transition, I'm becoming more and more of that person too. I mean, obviously I'm the future of the farm. Mm -hmm. um, it, obviously they pay the bills for us, um, you know, but as far as you know, actual physical numbers, everything got changed last year when we went through a farm transition, because essentially we were having to buy half the farm back. Okay. And so, you know, I can't give you rough estimates, but we, we've had them for going on seven years now, at least four of them. And so they're paying the bills. They've been a very good investment for us. And like I said, we won't be able to take care of the cows the way we have been without them. We have about five minutes left. Uh, how do you manage mastitis with the robots? Is other health worse or better than before? So other health is great. Obviously I said uh, SMAXL 130, 
we, we usually have one case mastitis. Um, but we use a CMT paddle. If a cow comes up with a high conductivity, we'll test her and we'll deal with her accordingly. Mm -hmm. Some cows just have high conductivities and it doesn't mean they have mastitis. So the big thing you do is just bring a CMT paddle, go around and check the cows that you're concerned about. Okay. Uh, there's a question here, David, kind of related to your transition. Did your production change or drop when you transitioned to robots? And has it increased compared to milking with a conventional system? So maybe now looking back or four or five, six years. Um, and there's kind of a related question looking at nutrition when you switch to robots. Um, you just want to comment on that? Sure. So initially in the flat barn parlor with 220 cows, I think our production was at 65, 70 pounds. Um, when we went from the parlor and the robot barn, four robots, we got up to 86 pounds. The parlor was pretty poor because it was the cows going dry. When we then transitioned at all robots, it stayed at 86. So it meant that we were crowding the barn because our, our, we brought in poor cows and our production didn't change. And uh, now today we're up to 90 pounds, but you have to realize we've, we've added over 120 cows since we initially started the eight robots. So we've been growing, growing, growing all this time. Last year was the first year we finally transitioned into improving the herd versus growing the herd. And if we get another year under our belt, I think we'll be that much further ahead. From a nutrition standpoint, uh, it's you know obviously a little more expensive, but the difference is we're feeding the cow based on her individual needs and not just blanketing the herd. So in a, a parlor, you know if you have one, two groups, um, you're treating each group as, as one. Whereas with the robot, we're able to individually feed the energy to them. And so we can manage each cow individually, just like a small dairy could. Okay. Um, so there's some questions about the robotic feed. Uh, if you could design the perfect robotic feed, what would be, and do you use, I think there's a question down here, nutritionally, uh, are you using flavor in your pellets? So something, a couple of questions about the pellets. What's yeah, the perfect so pellet? It's just a robot pellet. Um, there's no additional flavoring to it. Um, as far as, you know, if I could do anything different to you, I'd make it cheaper, but that's kind of impossible, so. Mm -hmm. So another question kind of wrapped around, what's your next technology that you're gonna be looking at, David? Are there any that are coming down the road that you think, well, that would really be nice to have at some point? So somewhat recently, they've come out with somatic cell testers on the Laley robots. We didn't feel that it would benefit us because we already run a pretty low count. So that's, you know, obviously something you could consider maybe on one or two robots for your fresh cows or something like that. From just a technology standpoint, for us right now, we're not considering anything major. Um, you know, a feeding system wouldn't be very applicable for us because we need two of them just based on the size of our herd. And so it's always going to be cheaper to run a tractor and a mixer. Um, you know, we're kind of in a position of we've, we've had this farm transition. We're transitioning from basically family labor to outside labor. And so that's kind of our goal is to continue to improve the herd and then continue to improve, you know, kind of our working relationship and knowing who's doing what. Um, because we're, we've made that switch from family to full-time labor that's non-family. So that doesn't really answer it, but... Right now, that's not really our focus. Okay. Uh, we only have a minute left, so I don't know if you can cover this, but ask, they're asking about breeding. Uh, did, how do you breed your cows after transitioning? And are you also maybe looking for better traits for the robots, things like that? Yeah, so we have activity collars. Everything's bred on that. I think we give about 5% shots to get them bred. Um, from sire selections, you know, again, I touched on it, utter cleft, root teat placement, and teat length. We also genomic te test. Basically, anything that's got a strong cleft is not going to be considered. Anything that's got close teats or short teats is not going to be put, considered for breeding. Um, we consistently have a 50% conception rate, so breeding has definitely not been an issue for us. Um, I think that's pretty standard with anyone with collars, so. Okay. So we're pretty much out of time now, folks. I'm sorry, we have a, about a few questions left. I need to stop recording. If you wanna stay here for another minute or so, um, we could um, address those questions if it's okay with you. There's only three of them. <laughs>